Welcome to the California Earthquake Clearinghouse virtual workshop webinar. Um, this is the second of two. We had one previously in April and uh, they were originally meant to be in Northern and Southern California, but due to COVID extensions, um, we've had to result to just doing two webinars. Uh, hopefully um, everybody's been able to catch one either at the earlier time in April or the later time now today. Um, just like to introduce uh, the California Earthquake Clearinghouse Managing Members. Uh, the Clearinghouse is represented by ERI, USGS, California Geological Survey, Cal OES, and the, and the California uh, Seismic Safety Commission. <laughs> this webinar is supported with National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program grant funding, EMF 2021, California uh, 0020, uh, with FEMA and U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and is hosted by, the, by ERI, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. The purpose and goal of the workshop is to improve and increase understanding of the California Earthquake Clearinghouse, how it works, when it's activated, who participates, how to be involved. Um, we're gonna cover post-event data collection, processing and access. Uh, that includes the, safe, safety, the, the safety assessment program as well as disaster service working work program as it applies to Earthquake Clearinghouse. And just gonna be posting this throughout the talk, but please uh, write down at some point our California eqclearinghouse.org website. So the logistics of the webinar is gonna be about an hour and a half long. Uh, we're gonna have six speakers talking for about 15 minutes each. We've saved 30 minutes at the end for question and answers. If you have questions, please place them in the Zoom question and answer box. Um, I believe that comes up at the bottom of the screen. There. I'm not quite sure, but that, please put them in the, in the Zoom question and answer box. And once again, there's our, 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 our email our list, our website, excuse me. So the speakers in order, I'll be, I'll be talking, I'll be giving a brief intro about the, the Clearinghouse. Heidi Tremaine with ERI, uh, the Clearinghouse co-chair is gonna be talking about Clearinghouse operations and support. Kate Thomas is gonna talk up from California Geological Survey is gonna talk about field data collection. Yvette LaDuke from Cal OES is gonna be talking about Clearinghouse coordination uh, with the Cal OES State Operations Center regions and local government. Don Gluckert with Cal OES is gonna talk about the disaster service worker program and River Singh with Cal OES is gonna talk about the safety assessment program. So the California Earthquake Clearinghouse um, is basically a physical location where scientists, engineers, and other professionals become part of a larger temporary organization whose primary purpose is to collect and disseminate perishable field data. The Clearinghouse provides the opportunity for all agencies and researchers in the field uh, to coordinate reconnaissance efforts, manage and access to restricted areas, and share findings. Who comes to the Clearinghouse? Basically scientists, engineers, economists, sociologists, and others who conduct post-earthquake related field investigations in the affected area. The Clearinghouse uh, managing partners that I mentioned before are represented by ERI, California Geological Survey, Cal OES, the state, uh, the uh, California Seismic Safety Commission and the USGS. And then we have a whole huge range of partners who collaborate with us. The ones that are just kind of mentioned here are a few. We have many, many others who come and support uh, information gathering at the Clearinghouse. Just a little historical background on the Clearinghouse. The first informal California Earthquake Clearinghouse was convened by state geologist Wesley Brewer the day after the magnitude 6.6 .6 San Fernando earthquake in 1971. Um, more than 40 geologists, seismologists, and engineers convened at the California Geological Survey Office, then known as the CDMG. And these included representatives from Caltech, uh, Los Angeles, uh, uh, LA City and County, UC Santa Barbara, USC, Cal State LA, University of Washington, uh, CGS, and other state agencies that pr and private consultants who met there to exchange information. Uh, Governor Ronald Reagan recognized the value of this earthquake clearinghouse, which then led to legislative action to ensure that lessons from future earthquakes would be learned. Um, CGS has authority to, to, uh, to lead or, or initiate the, the clearinghouse um, based on the public resources code. So after a major and or damaging earthquake in California, the California Geological Survey is authorized to establish an earthquake clearinghouse and works in partnership with the ERI, USGS, Cal OES, and the California Seismic Safety Commission. This is within the public resources code, which also outlines our other responsibilities, which includes that we carry out programs in cooperation with federal, state, and local government agencies that will reduce the loss of life and property and protect the environment by mitigating geologic hazards. Um, this includes hazard assessment, 
uh, including identification and mapping of geologic hazards and estimates of the potential consequences to life, property, and the environment, and the likelihood of occurrence. Um, also included in the, in the state code is emergency, CGS is, is to provide emergency response to geologic hazards included but not limited to those related to natural disasters, including the monitoring and assessment of anomalous geologic activity and the operation of a clearinghouse for post-event earth science investigations. Um, we have supporting agreements with our various partners. CGS is to provide geotechnical data and advice to the Cal OES regarding natural hazards in support of emergency planning and information support as required during the state disaster response operations. Uh, during a natural hazard emergency event, there is direct communication with Cal OES via the 24-hour duty officer and the Cal OES hazard specialist. CGS also coordinates investigations with the USGS under Memorandum of Understanding. The most recent ones were 1996 and 2000. And when an event occurs and the clearinghouse is activated, CGS co coordinates its emergency response with ERI, the California Seismic Safety Commission, and other state, local, and academic and private entities. So the clearinghouse, can't see the top of my slide, is activated after an earthquake that meets any of the following parameters. So when an urban area is struck by a damaging earthquake of magnitude six or higher, uh, upon recommendation of managing partners, such as CGS, USGS, ERI, Seismic Safety Commission, and Cal OES, uh, uh, when we agree, even when the magnitude threshold is not exceeded, but damage is significant, or in a remote, uh, less densely populated area when an earthquake is large enough to cause damage and structure to lifelines. A federal disaster declaration is not necessary to activate the clearinghouse, but the clearinghouse will always be activated when an earthquake federal disaster uh, declaration occurs. And it, just glancing back to Ridgecrest, when that one happened, we had the magnitude 6.4 and it was in a somewhat rural area, but it also had the base, the military base to the north. Um, and in the first hours of trying to, to collect information, um, some of that information was, we actually got off of social media. We were able to see that locals in the area were starting to take pictures of cracks in the road. They were following those cracks out into the alluvium. Um, we were starting to get pictures of damage um, showing up uh, in different platforms of social media. Now, all the a caution is that we can't always trust these images are true to the event because sometimes fake ones get put up, but it was really helpful for us to start to get a picture of what was going on out there really, really quickly. The California Earthquake Clearinghouse Operations Support, um, each of us have uh, different things that we do and we uh, and many of them we're doing uh, together in coordination. ERI is, is supports hugely our operations, our communication briefings and our virtual clearinghouse among other things you'll hear more about that from Heidi. CGS supports operations, data collection and database management. Uh, the USGS works with CGS with data collection and database management as well. Uh, the Seismic Safety Commission supports our operations, Cal OES supports us by securing a physical location to have the clearinghouse and communicates with uh, the Cal helps us with communication with the, the state emergency operations center. Data collection apps are used uh, to facilitate systematic gathering documentation and dissemination of data, observations and findings on support is provided for uh, accessing a geological collection app. Evening briefings provide a forum for field teams to report out their findings. Briefings include call-ins from other remotely located field personnel who are not at the clearinghouse. It also includes invited agencies and representatives at the California Emergency State Operations Center in Sacramento. Uh, communication and coordination with emergency management officials is, is crucial to our operations. The clearinghouse management has direct communication with Cal OES through the 24-hour duty officers with the State Operations Center. Uh, the SOC uh, can arrange for helicopter flyover support for initial reconnaissance. Whoops, I'll go back, went too forward. Um, for initial reconnaissance um, and, and helping us to get an idea of, of, of what's going on out there. Evening briefings are shared with the State Operations Center and outward to regional and local emergency management, which is crucial. Links. Uh, the Clearinghouse also links the scientific and engineering communities with agencies and organizations responsible for emergency response and recovery so that the Clearinghouse can, findings can help inform that response planning. So some of the examples, you know, at, in the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, flyovers, getting, getting uh, support to fly out over the rupture area is important. It gives us a good idea of the distribution of, of 
where the fault occurred and the potential areas is where significant damage can, can be. Um, it's also important for us to be monitoring after the event uh, continued deformation. And we've seen this uh, in uh, Napa and we've also seen it in Ridgecrest where following the event, there is still uh, potential damage going on, potential uh, geologic or earthquake phenomena. In this, in this particular picture, it shows some lateral spreading in the town of Trona, uh, which continued after the main events occurred. Uh, the, the larger map here is a provisional surface rupture map. Uh, after the 7.1, uh, within four days, we got out a preliminary uh, surface rupture map uh, by support of our GIS team. And uh, this was posted on the Learning from Earthquakes website. This particular map came out about a month and a half later, and it shows the culmination of, of what we knew at that time. Um, very, very helpful to others that are coming into the region and to trying to assess what's going on out there. The physical clearinghouse benefits, um, the clearinghouse provides rapid assessment of the geologic hazards and documentation of perishable scientific information. This is of use to the scientific and engineering community for improvement of building codes and engineering scientific advances. The clearinghouse also links the scientific and engineering communities with agencies and organizations responsible for emergency response via the evening briefings, the virtual clearinghouse and direct communication with the state emergency operations center. The Clearinghouse provides scientific expertise important for potentially directing response uh, resources such as personnel, equipment, and supplies to impacted areas that may have been missed by standard response measures. Uh, the Clearinghouse supports coordination of teams and individuals in the field, and it supports communication and coordination to expand access to restricted areas. So that's my part of it. Um, I'm going to be um, just posting my email up there for, for briefly for you to catch. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker, which is Heidi Tremaine. Uh, with e she is the, the Clearinghouse Vice Chair, the ERI representative, and she's going to be talking about e ERI Clearinghouse operations and support. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, as Cindy said, I'm the Executive Director of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about um, how ERI supports the California Clearinghouse and responds to different earthquakes. Mm -hmm. Uh, EERI is the leading nonprofit membership uh, organization that connects those dedicated to understanding earthquake risk and inspired to increase earthquake resilience in communities worldwide. We have a multidisciplinary membership uh, that has a lot of engineers in it, of course, especially structural and geotechnical engineers, but also many earth scientists, social scientists, architects, planners, emergency managers, and many others. We feel that multidisciplinary mix is critical to advancing seismic safety. We are operated by a small staff based in Oakland, um, but appreciate our, mem our members that are volunteer for activities around the world. Our flagship program is our Learning from Earthquakes program, and this is the program that operates and supports the clearinghouse activities. ERI, um, has been conducting reconnaissance for more than 50 years and uh, trying to investigate and study what happens after major earthquakes around the world. Some examples of some highlights of recent work by the, our learning from earthquake programs. We send teams to earthquakes, so we have a few examples here. We also have a variety of committees that are looking at identifying uh, research priorities, understanding different aspects of the community and how we could better, best study them in after major earthquakes around the world. We have a virtual response team, a travel study program to train early career members in how to conduct reconnaissance in the field. Um, and we support the clearinghouse in, in our role in reconnaissance. We also have a lot of advocacy and dissemination activities that are undertaken by the Institute through this program. That includes a lot of conferences and meetings uh, that we host sharing findings from recent events. And we host a lot of webinars these days to do that as well. We are, have a function through the NEHRP agencies, that's the uh, National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, uh, in support of the key four agencies in that program, and uh, have a task to support the formation of technical clearinghouses after major earthquakes. Uh, we work with them together, and that's how uh, URI fits in this space and why we partner so closely with the California Earthquake Clearinghouse. Kind of taking a step to, to, as a pause here, it's also a good moment to describe and really think about what post-earthquake reconnaissance truly is and how that might be different from emergency response. 
when we talk about reconnaissance, we're talking about science scientific or engineering investigations that are aimed at documenting important observations, and identifying research topics and lessons for practice. We're studying what has happened in the earthquake and how that can improve our future performance after major earthquakes. It is different from true emergency response and is different from some of the activities that are undertaken on behalf of communities in the response phase, like tagging of structures to identify if they're safe to occupy, um, and it's not typically long detailed research studies. Those will typically happen after, but the reconnaissance, the initial findings might influence some of those future steps. And it's also not advising owners on how to make repairs or reconstruct their structures. But these lessons are critical to improving the nation's safety, California safety, and um, uh, the lessons that come out of reconnaissance shape building codes in the future and can influence practices around the world. Thinking of the clearinghouse function, some of these were really emphasized also by Cindy. Um, the clearinghouse is designed to facilitate these field investigations by scientists, engineers, social scientists, other researchers, other practitioners um, who are there to better understand the impacts of this earthquake and how it might affect future practice. It also assists these people uh, coordinate their findings with emergency management. Um, it provides a forum for sharing information through meetings, through the clearinghouse to make sure that field work is tracked and coordinated to avoid duplication of effort. Um, information is also synthesized from, from these, uh, res those responding to the clearinghouse to improve response and also recovery planning. Uh, the clearinghouse is a unique place where people volunteer and show up to participate, but it does not direct or control what the activities the participants do. That it kind of, they operate under their own auspices for their own purposes, but the clearinghouse provides a mechanism for them to coordinate. The clearinghouse component, as, as Cindy mentioned, often takes place as a physical clearinghouse location where investigators can come to coordinate and share. Also a virtual clearinghouse location where findings can be shared, data can be posted, and also briefings that take place on a regular basis uh, throughout the response phase uh, to better uh, share and coordinate findings. Outcomes of the clearinghouse kind of vary, but there's a lot of uh, results that come from this collaboration of volunteers. Uh, it is an attempt to document perishable and ephemeral data that may be lost if it's not investigated and observed quickly and measured. Um, the outcomes of the clearinghouse will inform future research, areas of mitigation, improvement of building codes, um, improvements for professional engineering practice. Uh, it also will inform emergency operations and response through the, the, the close collaboration Cindy mentioned between the clearinghouse and the state operations center and the emergency response activities. And that can also identify concerns for public safety that, are, that emerge from researchers who are out there in the field. And of course, um, the clearinghouse can also influence recovery policies and, and, and necessitate the need for additional funding to the impacted community as well. ERI does serve as the vice chair of the California Clearinghouse in particular, and we host the website, support training and planning with CGS and the other managing partners, um, and facilitate clearinghouse communications. Um, and we provide a key link to the engineering, the engineering community and many other reconnaissance partners. And I wanted to kind of describe some of the activities that take place and give you two examples of some recent responses that I thought might be helpful uh, to understand how the clearinghouse truly functions. Um, ERI will often will support the California clearinghouse in establishing the uh, virtual clearinghouse website, deploying notifications, uh, facilitating and supporting uh, CGS at a physical clearinghouse location, um, connecting and engineering and other investigators to the clearinghouse, making sure they're aware and participate and show up. Uh, we do a lot of pre-planning to make sure people are aware about the clearinghouse and the role that it plays in coordinating and avoiding duplication of effort. We host nightly briefings um, and make sure that data and is disseminated from the event, from the clearinghouse as well. Here are two examples. Um, first, the South Napa earthquake that took place in 2014. This was a small magnitude earthquake. The clearinghouse was open for about three days uh, dealing with investigators who showed up to try to study the impacts of that earthquake. Um, and in addition to having the physical clearinghouse open for several days, uh, we were also able to have several briefing calls for virtual participation as well. 
Um, as you can see, the earthquake happened at three o'clock in the morning and the clearinghouse was already activated um, and a physical location was, was secured and operating by 3 p.m. that evening. So within 12 hours, the clearinghouse uh, was deployed, ready, and notice was out for, for members to participate. Our first briefing took place that very evening, um, allowing people to coordinate and, and, and start their investigative work. Some outcomes for the South Napa earthquake I just have two examples here about how the clearinghouse informed the response um, and improved the, 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 the Im improved knowledge of the impacts of the earthquake. Um, there are some public safety concerns that are identified by clearinghouse participants in the field uh, that barricades um, established in front of some damaged buildings were just way too close. Um, and the message was able to be sent off to the emergency operations center to notify um, those doing the response to move the barricades to a safer distance to protect the public. Um, there were also a lot of concerns related to after slip. There was a lot of continued slip on the faults that affected some repairs of lifelines and other infrastructure, um, some rail, rail lines and road, road works. And the observation from our, our scientists in the field and geotechnical in the field geotechnical engineers in the field noticed this after, after slip and um, that information was able to be shared to some of those utilities that were making repairs so they better understood that it might continue to see ruptures and needed to, to design their repairs accordingly. Another example is the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake uh, sequence. This uh, Cindy also mentioned in our slides but give you a sense of about how the clearinghouse happened. Um, there was the Earthquake happened on the 4th of July around 10 a.m. and the clearinghouse was activated by that evening despite it being a federal holiday. Um, the physical clearinghouse was up and operational the very next morning. So within 24 hours, a uh, physical clearinghouse was formed to allow coordination to take place. Uh, the, the virtual clearinghouse website was live very soon thereafter and initial briefing calls to uh, study impacts were underway by the 5th of July. So in a pretty quick turnaround, the clearinghouse gets activated and can start coordinating with many researchers there. The physical clearinghouse operated for many days and uh, when, it, when it finally deactivated, a series of briefing calls continued virtually afterwards to coordinate the final researchers in the field and make sure that data uh, was being shared and coordinated as well. This is an example of some of the types of, it kind of further describes the type of things that took place. There were many, virtual reports, data sets, photos produced from that, from that clearinghouse response. There was the physical activation of the, of the location for a week with over 60 in-person participants. At least 10 different teams showed up. We had nightly briefings, um, and it, so it resulted in 10 briefings by the time we were through with over 120 participants learning about the earthquake. And we managed to capture a good amount of engineering data and scientific data uh, with a lot of the data collation led by the USGS and CGS teams. There are also a series of webinars, reports, and then there was a one year anniversary meeting where a lot of the findings were then shared out to the broader community as well. So uh, a pretty strong response from the clearinghouse where a lot of information was learned and a lot of lessons from our response also continue to influence plans for future earthquakes. Here's two examples of outcomes there. There were some untagged structures that were identified that had not yet been tagged and had severe damage and some gaps in local knowledge of, of the safety assessment program for tagging were also identified and uh, support was provided to the local community. So a strong response, uh, strong clearinghouse response also supported the local community response to that event. So I wanna close by kind of indicating how you can participate uh, in the clearinghouse and, and be involved. So when the next earthquake occurs, I encourage you to go to the California Earthquake Clearinghouse website to learn about what's happening, what's taking place, start seeing the findings as they roll out and posted. If you're actually planning to conduct reconnaissance or in the field, please collaborate. It's really important that people check into the clearinghouse. It allows you to get access to the sites. It will allow you to coordinate and collaborate with other colleagues in the field. You can attend the nightly briefings and uh, very importantly, prepare and contribute your data uh, for everyone's benefit. So if you are coming to the field, definitely check in and respond to the clearinghouse. We appreciate your involvement and participation. And then of course, after the next earthquake, everyone can really learn as well by a series of dissemin dissemination events that will be hosted after the earthquake. We'll always have some webinars, also some other maybe larger events, depending uh, a series of events may take place. So visit the Clearinghouse website for more information about how you can learn about the findings. 
And there are things you can also do right now to stay involved. Uh, first, subscribe to the California Clearinghouse mailing list. This is the way that we keep track of those interested and make sure that you're informed about activities of the California Clearinghouse. The link is here on this screen. Um, there are also many training opportunities that emerge and different exercises that occur throughout the year. Um, the uh, CGS recently hosted two GIS trainings for emergency managers. And so there's a lot of opportunities like that that emerge throughout the year. So being on our subscription list will help you be informed of those events. Um, and also I encourage you to join ERI as a member uh, by participating and becoming a member of ERI. You can join our learning from earthquakes activities and really think about and prepare for future earthquakes and better share your knowledge and your expertise uh, with other members who are interested in participating. We also have a lot of webinars that are free to members um, and also earthquake webinars that are free to others who are non-members. So I encourage you to uh, take a look at some webinars that are taking place. Uh, we have those posted at eri.org. The, there's an example of a recent one on the Indonesia earthquake that just took place, a quick race, quake brief, briefing just took place last month. Um, and there's another a briefing coming up on a recent um, earthquake that took place in near Tohoku again. And so uh, there's gonna be a quick quake webinar briefing coming up soon, sharing findings of that. I encourage you to attend. And my final slide just to show you, to really encourage you to join the Clearinghouse mailing list. Uh, here is the link of how to do so. You visit the site, you go to the top uh, right of your page uh, and you can join the mailing list right there. So I look forward to seeing you on at future Clearinghouse events and I encourage you to participate and learn with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. That was really informative uh, information on the Clearinghouse operations and support. Our next speaker is Kate Thomas with the California Geological Survey and she's gonna be talking about field data collection. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Thomas, and I'm the GIS Unit Supervisor for California Geological Survey. Um, this morning, I am going to, afternoon, excuse me, I'm going to be talking to you about our schemas, data, and field maps application that are, um, that uh, for our post-earthquake reconnaissance. This presentation was prepared with the help from Luke Blair from U.S. Geological Survey. CGS and USGS have been collaborating for years and really closely since the Ridgecrest um, earthquake in 2019 to develop a post-earthquake reconnaissance schema that, that is useful for both of our organizations. We also both use the field maps application. We're creating dashboards to facilitate communication during an event. And then um, we also work closely on the data compilation database, which happens during and after an event. The current um, schema team includes Tim Dawson, Carla Rosa, and myself from CGS, and Luke Blair from USGS. Allie Pickering was a, a really important member of this group while she was employed at USGS as well. The, um, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to be discussing the uh, data and data schemas the ESRI's field maps application, ESRI dashboards, and the data and um, compilation and sharing during and after an event. It's really important that we get our teams um, out collecting data after an event as quickly as possible before any weathering or erosion occurs. This rapid data collection allows us to define areas of interest for for other data collection activities, such as LIDAR and optical imagery. And it also increases our situational awareness of areas with ground deformation that could potentially affect infrastructure. After an event, we use these data to um, learn more about earthquakes, but also in other projects such as fault displacement prediction models. And also CGS uses these data to delineate um, alquis Priolo earthquake fault zones for regulatory purposes. So what is a schema? A schema is a representation of a plan or theory in the form of an outline or model. It helps us to visualize what the database should look like and should include um, layers and tables, fields, aliases, data types. So is it a text field or a number field? Field links, if it is a text field, so how many characters somebody can input into the field and any notes or instructions that should go along with the application. Um, it, Planning a schema allows us um, and ensures that the database, database is well planned out before implementation occurs. Once implementation happens and people start acquiring data, it's extremely difficult to go in and change a schema and ensure that those data can then be brought into a, a compilation database. So 
we want to ensure that this um, schema is well standardized and that um, it's well agreed upon before an event happens so we can quickly deploy our field teams. And as well as quickly deploying field teams, it allows us on the back end with the data to add data to this compilation database um, so that we can more quickly share it um, with our partners and other organizations. Schemas should take into account lessons learned from field teams, data compilation teams, as well as end user needs. So we need to be cognizant that our field teams are out there using cell phones. They're using tablets, small devices. So we don't want to have them scrolling through 60 fields trying to find the one they want to fill out. Um, it should have an intuitive interface as well so that someone who picks up the device can go and collect data and not have to go through a tremendous amount of training. Um, we want to those we want to look at what our end users need and collect that essential data. So we want to be able to collect data that is important to emergency managers, as well as compilers of the displacement data. And a schema should be adaptable to the limitations of a software into many different software applications. CGS and USGS have come up with schemas for points, lines, and polygons. The point layers, there are two point layers. One is an event information layer, which basically gives out the epicenter information, and that's filled out by myself or another GIS analyst um, as reference for the field teams. And then we have a point observation layer, a line observation layer, and a polygon observation layer that consists of schemas for surface rupture, liquefaction, slope movement, damage to facilities and utilities, as well as a node deformation layer. This node deformation layer is actually really important to include in a schema because it, it allows for the coordination of field response. So we can, people can very easily see on the map, okay, someone has been in this location, there's no deformation, I don't need to waste my time to go back to that particular area. This is an example of our surface rupture point schema. I'm not going to go through it. There's a lot of there's um, a lot of information here, but really what I wanted to show is that our schema consists of pick lists or drop downs where our field team can very easily choose um, the answer of their choice and then move on to the next. They don't have to spend time typing anything out. Our number fields, they include in the title the units which those data should be acquired in. And then we have note fields, which can take, which are text fields, which can take up to a thousand characters, giving, giving our field teams the, the ability to, um, to take as many, to take as many notes as they need to um, at that particular location. A quick introduction into field maps, just so you can see what the application looks like. Um, it is an Esri-based application. You sign in with an ArcGIS online account, and then you see a list of maps which you have access to. You simply click on that map. The map opens. Your, your location um, is in the center of the map at that time. We also have uh, different options up here where you can turn layers on and off um, and you can explore different options. But the main important one is your add data button. You click that and it brings up a list of, of deformation types that you can choose from. For ease in this presentation, I'm only showing our points here, but in the fields, our geologists would also see lines and polygons that they could choose from. So I choose fault rupture. Fault rupture shows up. I can add the point and a yellow dot would show up where the cursor is, or I can tap on the map to add the point. You can take a photo directly within the app or attach a photo that you took and is in your gallery. Um, if you happen to see red everywhere, it, mean, it just means that your GPS accuracy is not up to to um, the required, which I believe, which is 30 feet default in, um, in the Esri application. Conditional visibility really allows us to, um, to make the, the application more user-friendly to our field teams. So can, you, could, you might also hear it called um, contingent statements or smart forms, but, but it all means the same thing. It allows fields to only show up as they are needed. So here I chose fault rupture. A group for fault rupture shows up that I can fill out. If I were to have chosen liquefaction here, then only the fields related to liquefaction would show up. Um, the great thing is that within the group for, say, fault rupture, you can also have more conditional visibility statements. So here, if I choose fault slip component vector measurements, another group of fields shows up that allows our geologists to fill out that information. 
the same if I were to choose slip component, then slip component fields would show up here instead of vector measurement. So it's only giving the fields to the field team that they need to fill out based on, a, based on the, their previous answers. So it really cleans that up. But the great thing for the data compilation team is that all of our point data are in one layer. They are in one database that can be easily put into um, the data compilation database. Data availability and sharing is, is, is a hot topic. Um, and during an event, CGS and USGS will be sharing a stripped down version of the data which are acquired in field maps as a KMZ. And it will go on the EERI's learning from earthquake um, website that Heidi just got done talking about. Um, we are sh the data that would be included in that KMZ is the location, the date, and the name of the organization for the person that collected that. The reason we are doing that is because these data have not been vetted and we need to ensure that we are not releasing any sensitive information to the public that can um, that the press could get a hold of or others could use. And so we, um, we're gonna be regula regulating that very closely um, during an event. We will share data with our partners. We will share data with, with the SOC, the State Operations Center at Cal OES is needed, but really what is gonna go public is the location date and um, the name of the organization. We, are, we will be in our next event using Esri dashboards to facilitate communication with the SOC and other partners. Luke Blair created this um, example of a scientific dashboard for the Ridgecrest, um, Ridgecrest event. And you can see here, it's all interactive. So we have the 7-1, which occurred, and the 6-4 rupture, which occurred. Down here, we have graphs, which, which can show the vertical offset for the 7-1 and the horizontal offset for the 7-1, as well as the 6-4. And then we also have graphs that show the slip sense. We have the total number of observations which were taken, as well as some um, symbology so that people can understand the lines that you see on the map. And then we have the observational data so people can really dig into the observations as well as see the photos. It's interactive, so as you zoom in on the map, the amount of data that shows up in the graphs is going to change. We're also planning to have um, to design a dashboard that is more towards the information that the SOC um, may be using. So it will be show more of the facilities and utility damage. It'll still have the same map because that data set is linked, but it'll just show information to facilitate the response efforts which are going on. Um, both of these are shared to a group in ArcGIS Online that will be um, that I will be adding people to. The group is really strict, so people can't download the data, but they can visualize it and they can play with it. It'll also be in the clearinghouse so that we can coordinate our response efforts um, by using by by having a visual of the map as long as we have power in the um, in the clearinghouse to to show this and to um, have a computer up and going. Um, data distribution issues really need to be discussed and resolved. People need to be aware of data, data ownership and proprietary data um, and, and how it will be shared if people, if there is a larger um, database that people are sharing their data to, they need to understand how data ownership may change um, if data are, are put into that database. There's also been some talk in the SCEC community about who should curate and QC these data um, for the Napa 2014 and Ridgecrest 2019 events. It was primarily USGS and CGS efforts. Um, there's talk as if that should, should include the larger um, SCEC community um, to be involved in that. But we also have to be aware of the sensitivity um, issue, which I already discussed, which we can't have um, photos getting out that that may show um, deaths or, you know, we have to be cognizant of that, of, of the data which we are sharing out to the, to the general public. Um, and so all of that, all of those um, go into how do we manage data during and after an event um, occurs. And then also we need to look at 
as these larger data sets, such as imagery, um, LIDAR, uh, structure for motion models, these larger data sets, who is going to be responsible for hosting and disseminating those data and sharing those data to the larger community? You know, it takes a lot of resources for us for um, server space because some of these data sets can get to be very large. And we need to discuss as a community how, how are these data shared? Um, our future work and discussions, we're, we're, we're meeting monthly, um, the schema team to finalize our schema. And I, I'm sorry, this wasn't last week, this was three weeks ago, that we finalized our schema for surface rupture, liquefaction, slope movement, and no deformation. I will be reaching out to some other people to help us um, really focus in on that facility and utility layer to see what kind of data we can collect that will help emergency managers and the and um, people who are regulating the facilities and utilities. Um, and so we that's our next step in building out our schema. And we need to figure out the best ways for our field staff to vet their data. Um, now in this digital world, they're collecting data on their phones and tablets. It's being directly shared to ArcGIS Online. And we, as the data compilation team, are downloading those data and putting it into a database. What we're missing is that part where field teams used to come back into the fields and as they're adding their data to a database, they're, they're QCing it. They're spelling out their shorthands. They're, they're spelling out um, you know, acronyms they may be using. They're ensuring that, that the data are correct before it goes into the database. So we need to figure out the best way to do that now that we're in this digital world that really streamlines and doesn't slow down our dissemination of these data. Um, we do ask that if people share their data with CGS and USGS, that they help us by putting it into our schema. I'm more than happy to share our Excel file that lays out our schema, but really we'll take data in any format. But but if, if people put their data into um, the schema that we currently are working with, it will save us a lot of time because we don't have to go through and guess what fields um, each of those data should go into. And so um, Luke Blair and his team has done a really good job in the past of writing scripts to try to help um, speed that up. But really, that's what takes a lot of time with us getting our data out is taking these data and all these different formats and schemas and putting it into one data, um, one database. There also, um, if interest, we may have another group that we that we have that people can actually use our application, um, and and it would be managed by us, and then we would share those data out. But that would ensure that data are in our schema if people are interested in using it, and kind of eliminates that that um, management of the field application to 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 me and my team as people are out into the fields. Um, also. I talked about a lot about Esri and their applications, but there are other data acquisition applications out there that are not Esri based. There's some open source ones. Um, so I'm not advocating Esri here. It's just that both CGS and USGS are Esri shops and we use their products. So it makes more sense for us to use the field maps application, but there are you know, other applications out there that people can use. With that, I would like to thank you. Um, feel free to put any questions in the Q&A function. And um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Kate, uh, for that great presentation on uh, data collection. Our next speaker is Yvette LaDuke with Cal OES, and she's gonna be talking about clearinghouse coordination uh, with Cal OES State Operations Center regions and local government. Good morning, everyone, Thank, or good afternoon, I apologize. Thank you, Cindy. Um, again, my name is Yvette LaDuke, and I am the Earthquake, Tsunami, and Volcano Program Manager for the California Office of Emergency Services, and I work with Sherry Blankenheim, who is our Earthquake Program Specialist, um, to help facilitate clearinghouse operations during earthquake response. And as Heidi and Kate and Cindy all indicated, a lot of what the clearinghouse does is really beneficial and does help support um, response operations. Um, so, okay, so um, just to give you a little bit of information, um, what my presentation will do is give you a good overview of kind of how the response process works 
and how um, the clearinghouse fits into that. Even though the clearinghouse is not an official part of response operations, the information it, that is collected is provided to the response decision makers to help provide situational awareness for the, for the response operations. So once an earthquake, uh, a large earthquake event does occur, uh, the earthquake tsunami program duty officer at Cal OES will be that first um, to receive any type of alerts and response communications and will collaborate with the State Warning Center, which is the part of Cal OES that sends out the official warning communications. Also with Cindy and Kate at the California Geological Survey, also the State Operations Center, if there is a large earthquake event, the State Operations Center will be activated and our program does send um, staff to the, to the State Operations Center to provide subject matter expertise, as well as a representative from the California Geological Survey, which will be Cindy, um, unless she is out helping facilitate um, the earthquake clearinghouse operations, then there will be another representative from CGS in the State Operations Center. And then we also have our Regional Operations Center um, that also support operations and if we do have staff available will be um, present at those locations as well. So as a part of our response we work within the standard standardized emergency management system or SIMS. So SIMS is a process that was put in place following the Oakland fires um, and it really is a structure that is an overarching structure that all local, state, and federal response agencies work in so that we can have um, standardized systems and a way to make sure that we communicate with each other and that all elements are functioning in close coordination with each other. So it incorporates the emergency command system, which is field operations interagency coordination, so making sure that all the different agencies involved are able not only to communicate with each other, but implement any type of response operations um, together. Mutual aid, so if there's needs outside of the local jurisdiction to help support the event, if they don't have enough resources, we are able to work throughout the state and then if needed throughout the nation to get those resources into that area to respond to the event. And it also established the operational area concept, which are counties and their subdivisions, to coordinate any dam for damage information and resource requests. So SIMS and ICS um, are part of the California Emergency Services Act. And again, it just makes or it allows for standardized coordination to make sure everyone can communicate and work together effectively. It also um, makes sure that field coordination is in alignment and also establishes unified command with all of the agencies um, with the responsible jurisdiction. So this here is just kind of an org chart that gives you an overall picture of how this system works. So I won't go through the entire org chart, but you can see that there are different sections that report through a, a structure and this structure structure is implemented not only within California but nationwide so that everyone again operates the same way so if um, mutual aid resources are needed and resources are shared between jurisdictions everyone is working within the same framework and everyone has that familiarity. So Cal OES's responsibilities during an incident as I indicated earlier we would separate or we would set up our state emergency operations center and that would be operable um, to, to make sure that we are overseeing any type of incident and that we are able to um, have that situational awareness and provide any resources necessary to um, aid in the response. Within Cal OES, in addition to the State Operations Center, we also have um, our regional emergency operations centers. And within that, we have mutual aid region, regions. So this chart right here kind of gives you a graphical image of how that structure is set up and you don't need to know all the details of this, but we share this information with you so that when you are in the field responding to an incident, if you receive any questions from our regions or from some of our mutual aid partners, you can see how the structure is set up and why you may be getting questions from some of these different partners. So um, as 
our previous speakers mentioned, we had the Ridgecrest earthquake that occurred and it actually impacted two of our mutual aid regions. So it impacted Kern County, which is a part of mutual aid region five, and San Bernardino County, which is part of mutual aid region six. The mutual aid region five is within our inland region, and then mutual aid region six is a part of the Caloia Southern region. So during the response, um, several of our partners within the earthquake clearinghouse were um, presenting information and having information requests come from these various different partners within that response structure. So this gives you kind of that visual as to why that does occur and why requests come from multiple different sources. So setting up the physical location of the clearinghouse, as Heidi and uh, Cindy both mentioned in their presentations, following a large event, um, Cal OES will work with um, CGS and EERI to identify a location that would be suitable to house the earthquake clearinghouse. Um, it will be a large facility that can host any of the participants that do choose to deploy and participate in the clearinghouse to provide any kind of resource needs that would help to um, secure and provide for the facilitation of that location. So Cal OES We'll work with our state agency partners, and in the case of Ridgecrest, we actually worked with our local county partners to identify that location and make sure that the resources were there that were needed to support clearinghouse operations. And so Cal OES will have not only the duty officer, but we will have staff again in the state operations center that can help coordinate any of those needs to help support the earthquake clearinghouse. And the clearinghouse, again, will be located in a location as close to the event and we can get as possible making sure um, that it's a relatively as safe as a place that we can get. I know during Ridgecrest they experienced a lot of that aftershock shaking during that event. Um, so we do try to find a place that will be suitable to host the clearinghouse um, but yet hopefully far enough away um, that they will um, have a safe location to operate. So communications, the information that everyone who participates in the clearinghouse is really important and critical for emergency management partners. So again, while um, the clearinghouse is not that official response mechanism, the information is very beneficial to the responders. So for example, during the Ridgecrest earthquake, we had um, evening briefings that were provided um, where field staff could share their observations and communicate any information that they were able to collect. That information is then shared with staff working in the state operations center, which can then be shared out with our local county partners. There were also requests from our county um, partners for briefings from the clearinghouse. So fortunately, since we did have that location out in the area of the event, um, it made it fairly easy for clearinghouse staff to go over and um, support those requests and provide the information to the county response partners and also directly to the public. So it's really important um, that we receive this information as timely as possible because it helps our local jurisdictions know where there may be some possible damage, um, some ongoing um, rupture, um, and any of that type of information that is causing problems for critical infrastructure and local infrastructure and help them to know where some of those hotspots are. So again, the information that is collected in the field is very vital to the response operations, to damage estimates and damage collection, and also um, data is very helpful for just having a good idea of what is still ongoing in the field. So the emergency management priorities, um, as I just did mention, that clearinghouse information does feed into the State Emergency Operations Center and out to our regional operations centers and to the counties. And it helps um, provide information that is included in our situation status reports, um, to media reports, any social media that we're sending out. Um, it feeds um, information that is included in the aftershock forecast and reports from the field. And we also do conduct hazardous runs that help provide um, damage estimates, but again, what folks are actually seeing in the field can kind of help support that information um, that is included in the estimates. 
So again, down at the bottom, it just shows that we include after-slip information in the lateral split, spreading or subsidence that is observed in the field. And we always love photos. So any photos um, that folks have available in addition to the data that can be shared is also much appreciated. So as was indicated earlier, the partners are researchers, structural engineers, social scientists, and others. They're not, again, first responders, but are um, and not officially part of the incident field response, but are definitely included. And the information is, again, very valuable to response operations. Um, it's important to note that um, participants are not official building inspectors, and they will not ass officially assess or tag any buildings but can definitely help provide information if anything is seen that is of concern. Um, they are also instructed to call 911 if there is an immediate hazard that is noticed while in the field um, conducting um, analysis. Um, they're able to independently direct themselves, and again, there's no requirement to share information. We do appreciate information that can be shared. Um, and also, um, if we're seeing a lot of um, chatter on social media and a lot of information being shared on social media, um, it's great to have folks available in the field that may be available to go and check out some of these areas if it's something that we have not previously been notified of. So again, the briefings are really critical. It helps to um, inform some of our response reports that are provided, as I discussed on the previous slide. And the technical research is really critical to supporting ongoing discussions and decision making that occurs not only at the state level, but the regional and county level as well. So Cal OES and CGS work together to provide um, the state level coordination, and we do that in coordination with EERI, who's a critical partner in the Earthquake Clearinghouse, um, helping to guide decisions and prioritization prioritization of resources, and also um, really helps to inform Cal OES's decision making. So um, I really want to stress that not only is that information included in reports and just shared, but it does really provide um, vital information that is used in that decision making process. Then following an event, one of the really critical parts um, actually to an event, even though it follows after the event is has kind of ended, is the after action and the hot wash. And this is a really good opportunity for us to really break down what happened, um, what occurred in the field, um, the reporting that occurred, how that was used during the response to identify um, great opportunities that we were able to capitalize on and some things that maybe we could do better or look at incorporating into future events. So the information that is shared during these hot washes is really important for us um, to really take a look at the overall incident and to um, identify opportunities that we could um, maximize and or correct moving into the future. So we always encourage our clearinghouse participants to participate also in this hot wash discussion. And again, we encourage you all to download the Earthquake Early Warning app if you have not already done that. The MyShake app is free and it can be accessed on the App Store or Google Play. This is a great tool to have on your phones if you are working out in the field because if there is um, additional earthquake activity ongoing, um, you will receive early notification of that on your form. So on your phone, I apologize. So to help give you a little bit of heads up, um, if additional shaking is going to be happening, as many of you who did participate following Ridgecrest um, did experience. So thank you very much. And this is, um, again, Sherry Blankenheim's contact information. She is our Earthquake Program Specialist. So if you have any questions, please send those to her or you can send them to myself. Um, we are both happy to respond to any questions that you might have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yvette, for uh, uh, explaining the roles and relationships and interactions of Cal OES with the Clearinghouse and its participation. I think we're going to switch to our, our, our next speaker and then get back to Don Gluckert uh, after we hear from Gerber Singh. Gerber Singh is going to go ahead and talk about the, seismic, the, the safety assessment program, and then we'll switch back to Don Clark, Gluckert when we get his uh, uh, presentation up.
Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. All right, today I'll be talking about the um, safety assessment program here at Cal OES. Uh, to start off with, my name is Dabir Singh. I am a civil engineer here at Cal OES, and um, this program was intended to help local governments um, in when a disaster happens. Um, we want to get uh, the public back to their homes as quickly as possible, get the businesses back running as quickly as possible. Um, this is a little different from Clearinghouse. Uh, we actually work with local governments to assess damages and um, provide placards basically and let people know if their shelters and homes are safe or not. Um, just a brief, uh, brief background, um, this all started in 1971 after uh, Selma earthquake. And um, after uh, Whittier Narrows earthquake in 1987, we began issuing cards. So once you finish our training, you'll get a card. And in the card you could, um, whenever you get called for a disaster, you could show the card and you're able to go in that um, area and continue. Um, here's some documents we use. Um, as you can see, there's an AC, ATC-20 and ATC-45 um, earthquake guidance and flood and wind guidance. Um, we use all of those for our manuals. Um, we basically use the information and put it all together as a, as a giant um, manual that you'll get once you do a training. Um, so uh, SAP capabilities, it's managed by OES. We do most of the trainings. Um, we also do train the trainers, which can also um, have other people train other trainers. And um, we uh, look at multiple hazards like earthquakes, wind uh, damages, explosives, and um, hurricanes, and et cetera. And we cover multiple disciplines um, like um, geotechnical engineering, um, structural engineering and all those things. Um, there's different types of trainings. Like I mentioned, there's an evaluator training. These are the people that go out and they look at the building specifically and um, they inspect the buildings, uh, give up the placards. Coordinators are usually in the offices. They coordinate the evaluators on the field and train the trainer training is a uh, training offered by OES here. and where we teach evaluators to train other trainers. And so it's kind of like a spider web that just continues. Um, concept of operation. Um, SAP is a state resource used to help local government and does not replace the local government um, oversight of the disaster. SAP fits in with the incident command system, ICS, and is uh, compliant with the standardized emergency management system, SIMS in California, and the federal national incident management system, NIMS. SAP help is requested through online response informa uh, information management system, uh, RIMS in California. Um, the SAP MOU is necessary to identify SAP costs for FEMA eligibility and to identify responses of Cal OES and local government regarding the assistance. Um, so when it comes to requesting aid, uh, the local government will estimate how many buildings and areas are damaged. And we kind of have this uh, calculation in our manual where you could determine um, how many um, SAP evaluators you may need and you can find that on our website and manual. Um, there's different types of uh, people that uh, participate in our programs. Um, Don will talk about DSW volunteer work shortly. So we have the volunteers, usually from private sectors. Uh, we also have the local folks, usually they're engineers, architects from the local jurisdiction. We also have state employees. Um, they're also engineers and architects and building inspectors, but they work in state agencies. And to be approved for those cards that I was talking about, you need um, either a architect license, you need to be a, a registered engineer, geologist. Um, we have a list of people that could be approved for the licenses. Um, if you're not, you could get a certificate and you could be a coordinator during that time. 
so you could still help even if you're not qualified. Here's the list I was talking about, and uh, this is only for the ICC. Um, we also have um, uh, the bigger list on our manual that you can see. Here's what the cards look like. Um, as you can see, there's different um, different little things that tell you what you are. You're either a DSW state, volunteer, or a local worker. Um, we also do trainings for other states. And in those states, we don't really identify if you're a specific group of worker. We just give you a state card. So you can see Oregon is for Oregon people only, but California is distinguished. Um, we also practice, um, or we also teach uh, liability stuff. So immunity from liability under the SAP is provided through uh, California Good Samaritan Law and a person being deputized by a local government. So we kind of train you guys how to be deputized when you get deployed. Uh, volunteers are also covered with immunity from liability by being deployed by OES as described in the local emergency uh, as described in the California Emergency Service Act, and also under the California Business and Professional Code. Local government SAP evaluator under the mutual aid are also covered under the immunity provided by their home jurisdiction per the California Master Mutual Aid Agreement. Um, so compensation, I think Don will talk more about that shortly. Um, Usually um, the state and um, local governments will compensate um, the workers. And if you're a volunteer and you're deployed by the state, you'll get uh, compensated. Um, the evaluator role, like I mentioned before, is to um, serve, uh, look at buildings that are damaged and provide a rapid assessment and see if they're safe or not. <coughs> We could also provide detailed evaluations on questionable buildings. Evaluators do not do cost estimation, so we're not there to provide anyone with cost estimation. And we don't escort people in and out of their property, so we're not there as um, people who do that. We're just there to look at the building's safety. Um, here's one of the placards. Uh, usually the green one means it's good to go. The entire building is safe to enter. Yellow, there's some areas of the buildings that may not be safe and could use precaution. Red usually identifies with the building is not safe and should not be entered. And um, we also work with other states as well, like I mentioned before. And uh, we offer train the trainer classes, like I mentioned, and each state can have their own program based on ours. And we've deployed people to Hurricane Katrina and um, the Alaskan earthquake as well. So the infrastructure, um, like I was talking about before, we cover roads, bridges, pipelines, pump stations, airports, water facilities, and um, buildings and geotechnical sites. Here's some examples of um, where we sent our, our evaluators. Um, there's an earthquake on the bottom right um, and also the buckled uh, concrete column over there. Um, bottom left is a water treatment plant that was damaged. Um, the multiple hazards I was talking about earlier, usually earthquakes, windstorms, floods, fires, um, explosives, and sometimes uh, snow impacted structures. Um, here's a good example of a building that was damaged, I believe through an earthquake. And um, this got a red um, placard, but to note, this building was repaired. So just because we um, put a red placard does not mean the building is unusable. It could still be repaired. Here's another example of a building. Um, so we don't only look at the building that's damaged, also the buildings around that building. Um, so this building's obviously unsafe, but the building behind it has a potential to be damaged from the building falling on it. <clears throat> Here's just an example of um, what some strong winds can do to a building. Um, here's an example of a house that was burnt down um, in a hurricane, I believe. And also flood damages through hurricane. 
Um, I believe this is a fire in California that just ravished through our neighborhood. So we send our evaluators to all of these areas and kind of look at things. Another example of a flood damage. Um, I believe this was an explosive damage that happened uh, in a fertilizer plant in Texas. And here's an example of the um, snow roof or snow load impacts I was talking about. This is in Alaska. Um, we also um, do a little safety tutorial and um, teach people like the go kits they may need and field safety. <coughs> um, sorry, going back, we also um, kind of go over the USAR markings. Sometimes they're survivors and they have specific markings or their dead bodies or anything of that sort. Um, here's just an example of um, an area that was impacted by hurricanes. So teaching people safety precautions, don't walk near the cars, don't sit under roofs that could collapse anytime. And you could also get more of our information from the OES website. You could just search SAP in the search bar area. Um, there you could download our manual, um, what the placards look like. And we also have free trainings that we offer. And um, I think that's it for me. If you have any questions, you could also email us. Um, our SAP group receives these emails so we could get back to you pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you, Gerber, for uh, your, uh, your presentation on the safety assessment program. And we're going to switch now to hopefully get Don Glukert on so we can talk about the uh, disaster service worker program. We're waiting for Don um, to come up. We can uh, switch over to our Q&A. Um, at least I can go to the top one here from uh, Mindy Zuckerman, can field maps data be amended with DGNSS points? I guess that would go to Kate. Yes, um, you can, if you're asking if a GPS a unit can be added to the field maps application, yes, it can. Um, there, you just need to go into the settings. Um, we've had people use bad elfs and have really um, some good success with it. Um, you can connect um, via Bluetooth through your cell phone and um, and the GPS unit, or I believe there's also, you can connect it um, through cables as well. Thank you, Kate. Um, Mike Conaway, uh, I think asked you directly, but um, in the chat as well, but are the schema available digitally to others? Um, yeah, you can, if you just email me at kate.thomas, at conservation.ca.gov, I will be more than happy to send you um, the, Excel, the Excel version of our um, schema so that you have that on hand. And I'll put my email address in again. I think I already received your email, but um, in some other ones, but definitely um, we are happy to share that with others. Okay. Um, just looking at a message, um, Don listened. Um, next question was from uh, uh, Catherine Scherer. I think she had to drop off, but we, we I'm gonna go ahead and just read her question for the benefit of others. Can you please provide details on the ethical or re legal reasons that the data release will be restricted uh, to location, date, person, but not provide observations? Thanks. Um, yeah, and she had a she had a much longer question in the chat. If others are interested in that, asking about the ethical and uh, legal reasons for um, photos as well. Um, so, as far as photos are concerned, we really don't want to um, be be allowing photos to go out that could show. Uh, you know, um, we have to be sensitive. Cindy, feel free to jump in if I'm stuttering, but um, <laughs> we don't want photos to get out that are that could be considered insensitive, um, especially in a large urban environment. If, say, uh, an apartment complex came down, um, or or showing um, not to be vivid, but showing dead bodies or body parts, you know, we need to be cognizant as a state and and federal institutions that we are being sensitive to the public and and privacy reasons. Um, and and that that I, I 
I don't know, and, legal, and Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it's a legal issue as far as, um, as we can't supply that information. It's just that we are trying to be sensitive to the people who we are supporting during this emergency um, event. As far as the data, we have had a lot of requests from organizations to, um, and especially as Kate pointed out, to our um, from our our uh, universities and other academic institutions that we share the slip um, rates and other other data that are relative to um, to the earthquake uh, offsets slip and things like that. Um, we don't share that right off the bat one. It hasn't been vetted. We don't, we wanna ensure that the data are correct before it goes public, but also both CGS and USGS are scientific um, organizations. And we do have people who publish on those data and we, um, we do use those data as, as well for publication purposes. And, um, it's not that we won't share the data, um, especially to other emergency responders, if it is necessary for, for life-saving events or to help with the response. But really it's a, um, it, there's, there's people have the, have the right to publish on their own, on their own data and put the papers out and do their scientific studies. And we get the data out as soon as possible as well. Um, Cindy, I'm going to let you step in there since you're a geologist and you can talk about that a little bit more. Um, but, but that is my understanding of why we don't give those data out. Um, and especially during an event because they haven't been vetted. Cindy, you're muted. I, yeah, I, I agree. I agree uh, with what Kate said too. And um, uh, just another example: uh, when we were collecting data on the 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 airbase uh, north of Ridgecrest, all of that information had all those videos and, and uh, photographs had to be vetted because of the uh, concern for any building uh, would be critical uh, if it were exposed. And so um, all of our, our, our field shots had to be cropped or removed, um, but they all had to be reviewed before um, we could release any of that information. Um, you know, that could be a similar situation on, on, on some other property as well. So it's just important that we make sure that nothing's getting out that that could um, uh, harm or mislead uh, and, and create certain attitudes towards the property that that was being uh, recorded. So we just try to do a quick review of everything that goes out. Um, I'm not sure, is Don ready to go on? I see Don's face, right, thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up, Don, if you're ready to I go had on. To, yeah. I had to <laughs> see the computers. Let's see if I can still share the, no, I can't okay. share the present. So, but you have my presentation, right? Yes, I'll share it for you, Don. Yeah, that'd be great. Let's go. Let's roll with it. Introducing John Glukert with, uh, with <laughs> Kel OES. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction, Cynthia. Of course, I can't see the, the uh, screen. So um, it's not, I don't know if it's up yet. There you there go. There it is. Excellent. Okay. Uh, click on the little, uh, uh, you know, slideshow screen down in the lower area underneath the. Just give me a second here. Having a bit of an issue getting it to share correctly. One second. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Of course, I'm like the guy who, you know, like that class right after lunch. You know, everybody dreaded math class after lunch. That's it. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with it. Um, my name is Don Gluckert, and I handle the uh, Cal OES Disaster Service Worker Volunteer Program. Uh, we are the, the, the sponsors of this program for every jurisdiction in California. Um, the program is handled locally by counties and by cities. Can we go to the next slide? please. All right. And this program is primarily about workers' compensation benefits that are offered to injured disaster service worker volunteers. And I'll get more into that in a moment. I would like to, to however, 
explained that there is a distinction between disaster service workers and disaster service worker volunteer. If your paycheck comes from any jurisdiction in California as part of California government money, then you are automatically a disaster service worker. You uh, signed some papers during your orientation, you swore the oath, which means that your organization, your supervisor can deploy you to assist in an emergency. The volunteers are unpaid. The moment they are paid, they get even a, a nickel, they are no longer a volunteer and are not entitled to workers' comp benefits at all. So the program provides disability benefits, uh, doctor care, hospital care, prescriptions, um, supplemental job displacement training if necessary, and, and of course, um, just death benefits. We also provide limited liability protection, but that is through good Samaritan laws, both on the state and federal level under and under the Volunteer Pro, uh, Protection Act and any other statutes on local jurisdictions. Okay, next slide. Um, the program is administered locally by accredited disaster councils, which is every county and every city in California and their authorized designees who are fire districts, sheriff's departments, um, and in some counties, they even authorize their health department uh, to be authorized designees. And so what does an ADC or an authorized designee have to do? They register the volunteers, they supervise them, they must train them, then they deploy or activate those people. They keep records of who went where. If someone is injured, they submit the claims to me. Next slide. Anyone can be a disaster service worker volunteer who is both physically and mentally capable of performing disaster service duties. The person can be employed, unemployed, or retired. They can also be a non-citizen, and we are one of the few states that allows that. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get to oath subscription. Even minors in California with their parents or guardians permission may also serve. However, it is at the discretion of the jurisdictions whether they choose to use minors in disaster service. Next slide, please. So a DSW volunteer is registered with an ADC, a county or a city, or an authorized designee, such as they might be a search and rescue member with a sheriff's department or a cert member with a fire department. Um, Cal OES, on the whole, does not register volunteers except through the SAP program uh, and um, civil air patrol and some law enforcement. Volunteers are not paid as I, as I said, and they're activated by their registering agency only. Um, they can be impressed into service, which usually means, let's say there's uh, a dam break and people are out filling sandbags and uh, the fire chief says, hey, Jimmy, I need you to fill sandbags and I'm gonna sign you up as a volunteer, which is a good idea. and. Um, Auxiliary firefighters, note over on the right, it says not volunteer firefighters, because volunteer firefighters receive their workers' compensation benefits through primarily the um, agency through which they signed, signed up, such as Butte County Fire Department uses almost all volunteers. Okay, next slide, please. There are certain activities that count as eligible activities and others that are ineligible, eligible and ineligible to apply for workers' comp benefits if injured. So if we're in a state of war, we are not. Proclaimed emergencies, we are. We are still in the, the proclaimed emergency of COVID. Uh, search and rescue missions, which happen frequently in California. And then activities to mitigate imminent threat. Imminent means it's upon us. It doesn't mean like, well, we're going to have fires this summer. Yes, but we don't right now. Well, we did a few weeks ago in Orange County. So um, imminent means it's upon us. Um, Out-of-state deployments, 
can happen, but uh, the director of Cal OES must authorize that in writing. Uh, mutual aid assistance, uh, your county is requested to help a neighboring county because you have a mutual aid compact. We also count training as an eligible activity. So training to perform the disaster services for which you could be deployed is also an eligible activity. And travel to and from the incident site, not a training activity, but an incident site. It is only for medical. We do not cover vehicles. Next slide, please. Excluded activities are day-to-day -day things, a house fire, some traffic collisions. Yes, it may be calamitous, but it's not a disaster. It's not a proclaimed disaster. So, and other prepared, preparedness or planned activities like um, educational fairs. We're gonna set up a first aid booth at a marathon. Uh, we're gonna direct traffic at a concert. Those are not emergencies and those are not training for emergencies. So those are excluded. Um, Self-activation, which means that a person could be a registered volunteer with the city, but they decide to show up somewhere to help out without them being requested or deployed. And so self-activation uh, nullifies the eligibility. <clears throat> and then, as I said, travel to and from the training site is not an eligible activity. Okay, next slide, please. Persons who wish to be DSW volunteers need to register. So there, there is a registration form on our website which is, is pretty good and anybody or any jurisdiction can create their own, but it needs to have certain elements on there. Um, we need to have, of course, the name and address of the applicant. And what classification is this person? There are 13 approved volunteer classifications and they'll be on another slide here. And a person can be on more than one. They could be animal rescue and they could also be in logistics or communications. So. Um, can wear a lot of hats. The loyalty oath subscription is included on the registration form. It must be signed by the volunteer. If a volunteer says, I can't sign it because it's against my religion, my um, what I believe in, it could also be that I am from another country. And like I said, even non-citizens can, but if the person says, taking the oath to the Constitution of the United States in California's Constitution um, contradicts my loyalty to my own native country, I can't sign this. Without their signature and attestation to the oaths, they cannot be a DSW volunteer, and that is in law. Um, we also have to have, and, and when they sign the oath, that's the date of their registration. And then there has to be a person who's authorized to enlist them. Currently, we do not have any objection to persons self-certifying the oath. It used to be that you had to be before someone authorized to give the oath. But at this level and during COVID, we don't require that. However, jurisdictions could still require that. Next slide, please. Here are the 13 classifications. And the third from the bottom is safety assessment program evaluator that uh, fits in very keenly into our conversation today. Next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, at a disaster site and the volunteers are there, someone needs to supervise those people. It's usually designated by the jurisdiction and um, they can decide. It, it could be someone who is a government employee or they could say, John over here is extremely knowledgeable. He's a, he's a volunteer, we're gonna allow him to supervise. That's perfectly acceptable. So they should also know how to complete the claim forms, uh, what the requirements are and taking care of the volunteers and then who to send uh, claim forms to, which is me, 
and um, we'll we'll get into that pretty quickly here. All righty, next. Uh, all right, training. Like I said, they it, volunteers need to be trained, and it can be in a classroom. Many times they're outdoor exercises. They have to be specific to their classification. Um, CERT teams have very specific training. They go through different levels of things. Um, let me say something about CERT members. They are our largest group of volunteers in California. A person who aligns themselves with a fire district as a CERT member is not automatically a DSW volunteer. That is a separate registration. So um, any of you out there who are um, working with CERT teams, please be sure that that is enabled. So then they're eligible for workers' comp benefits. Training must be approved in advance by the accredited disaster council or the authorized agency. There has to be a sign-in sheet, must be supervised, and as stated, commensurate with the classification for which they're training. Next slide, please. Activation. All right. Sometimes uh, verbal activation is not always um, available. So the best thing is that when, part of training for disaster service workers is that the, in their standard operation procedure or emergency operation procedure, they have activation guidelines. All of the cell towers are down, there's, uh, are down, there's no electricity, radio transmissions aren't working, but there's been a major earthquake. The people as part of search and rescue or cert teams have already been told previously, if those things happen, don't wait for a phone call because there won't be one. Meet at the corner of Jefferson and Forest Forestry and, and in the Safeway parking lot, and you'll get your marching orders from there. Other activation can come through emergency radio messages, or they have text messages they received, or they get a phone call from their supervisor or someone who's authorized to deploy them. Next slide, please. Files, specifically the oath file, the registration oath file, needs to be filed with the county clerk or the city clerk, or if it's there are certain members with a fire district, then wherever that, that designated center is, is where those files need to be kept. The reason is, if any of those people get injured, I need to have a copy of that registration form in addition to some other documentation, okay? All of these forms can be um, stored electronically. People ask me, Don, why can't we send them to you? We have 60,000 volunteers in California. I don't want those. So those can be stored electronically, scan them as PDFs, make them searchable. And then after someone says, you know what, I'm done as a volunteer, keep their record for five years and then you can destroy it. Next slide, please. Okay, when there's a workers' comp claim, there are several forms that are required to be sent to me in order to get this handled by State Comp Insurance Fund, who is our insurance carrier. And those forms are on our website. There's two state fund claim forms, the volunteer registration and oath form, and then a written incident by the supervisor, not by the injured person. If it was an injury due to training, then I also need a copy of the written training pre-authorization and the training sign-in sheet. Next slide, please. The 3301 form, this is important. This is one that has to be given to the injured volunteer within 24 hours of the supervisor's knowledge of their injury. The, the um, injured person can fill out the top portion and then the supervisor fills out the bottom portion. It is very important to give the injured person a copy of this form. So when they go to the ER or urgent care or their doctor, they produce this form, which tells that provider, this is a work comp claim form. Therefore, that person will not be billed directly. Okay, next slide. The next slide is the, uh, it's the 3267 form. This one's filled out by the supervisor at the incident. The injured volunteer does not see this form, nor does he get a copy of it, but I do. Next slide, please. Um, if 
due to the injury due to training, then of course I need who, what, where, when, and why. You know, I just, I need a written report on how this happened and um, who the supervisor was, et cetera. Next slide, please. I'm a little over time. So the written incident report can be sent in any fashion. It can be uh, in an email, it could be in a letter, it could be on a cocktail napkin, it doesn't matter as long as, as long as we know what happened. Next slide. This is a screenshot of the Disaster Service Worker Volunteer Program webpage on caloes.ca.gov. If you notice number two, that's the program guidance booklet. That's an 89 page booklet written by my predecessor, which is the Bible of the Disaster Service Worker Volunteer Program. It is really well done and it has a fantastic frequently asked questions section in there. Um, number three, uh, 3A and 3B, are our registration forms in English and in Spanish. These are gender neutral. And then down below, DSW workers' compensation information. Um, number three and number four are the two claim forms that should be downloaded and supervisors should uh, carry these with them uh, out in the field. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. My name's Don Gluckert. I'm the program lead. Uh, Hilda Vargas is the program manager. Um, don't call Hilda because <laughs> she'll say Don will be back tomorrow. So uh, she's got a lot on her plate. So she always just directs everything back to me. The best way to find that web page that I just showed you in the previous slide is what I put in red there. Go to caloes.ca.gov, click on the little magnifying glass and then key in DSW volunteer. The next page that comes up, it's like a Google search within our website, um, select DSWVP program webpage, and then you're there. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Don, for that. That's been great. Good to hear all that information again. Um, I think we can switch back to our uh, Q&A and uh, respond to any of the other questions that are still out there. Um, we left off at uh, Jonathan Allen's, is there a process and schema established to receive citizen science photos and information? That's a good one. I don't know if that goes to uh, CGS or to ERI to the Learning from Earthquakes website. Um, I can actually take that, Cindy. Um, okay. And then EER can fill in. Um, Heidi can fill in if she wants. Um, they may have another way. One of the things that we did for the tsunami response is we put out a um, put out a survey one two three publicly that people were able to um, to go in, answer a bunch of questions, upload videos, upload photos, and it was available to the general public to share those data with us. And it's something that I think we should consider. Um, doing for for earthquakes as well, because we got a lot of good information that we wouldn't have normally seen from the Tonga tsunami um, that hit and, and really, really great video footage um, from some people and and photos and and information. And so I think it's something that that we should look at building out for um, for the um, for earthquakes as well. And you know we can we can have a link to it on on the Learning from Earthquakes website. It can be hosted. It's it basically a survey one two three, is um, is through ArcGIS online as well, just like the um, field maps application is. And then I can download all of the data and share that out to people who need it. We also have a lot of our geologists who are out looking, you know, through social media tweets. But we have to be careful about that stuff, you know, to ensure it's with that. But but it's definitely something that I think is a great. Um, way to gather more information, especially from the people who are in that location. And Heidi, I don't know if you have anything you want to answer or add to that. I think so. I think it's a good area for future growth. And I do know there are some researchers looking at, at data sources and things like that. Um, there definitely was some response in the Puerto Rico earthquake looking at um, what was mm -hmm. observed there as well. So um, I think it's something that we'll learn more about and, and continue to, to grow in, in the coming years. Sorry, that trying to be polite, stay ah. muted. <laughs> um, uh, we have a comment here from Cheryl. Uh, I'm interested in the speaker's thoughts and info available on the usability and coordination of data from the geoscience engineering communities here with local jurisdiction who need inventory type data about community conditions and impacts 
for their application for disaster declaration recovery funds later. Um, jurisdictional databases form their data collection backbone, but those data structures are very widely from one jurisdiction to another in software quality content and staffing. Um, this is a structural one. I'm going to just yeah, maybe I, I can mention that. Um, I think this is definitely a, kind of an ongoing need, Cheryl, and I can see that there. There have been some instances that reconnaissance has been asked to look to see if we can uh, support that in the Alaska earthquake that took place a few years ago. Um, the clearinghouse was asked uh, for additional data that would support uh, understanding of the number of, of structures impacted and there was collaboration with some of the FEMA teams that go out to um, gather some of that information. Uh, kind of to your point, Cheryl, uh, for some of these declarations of disasters, which kind of prompt the flow of, of recovery money into the local community, they need to achieve a certain financial threshold. So the clearinghouse has been, has been uh, supported that to some extent in the past and definitely uh, those issues have come up on clearinghouse calls. I think actually directly transferring data between the local jurisdiction and the clearinghouse continues to be an area for future growth. Um, there was, uh, during the Napa earthquake, there was a pretty good, the, the, local, uh, the local SAP deployment and the local uh, city there did actually have a lot of their building tags and something available publicly um, and updated that map quite frequently. So um, it was an instance where kind of data sharing was, was a lot more common. And I think the challenge for the clearinghouse is just uh, establishing an sufficient relationships and uh, not knowing where the next earthquake is exactly going to be, but definitely an area for more growth um, as schema and, and data sharing kind of improves. It seems like there's a lot of trends along those lines with some of the great work that USGS and CGS are doing um, and some of the lessons learned from our recent responses. So, um, but I could definitely see the need and those jurisdictions needing kind of some of the baseline data to get them the funding and support they need um, in the recovery. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from, from Body about uh, how, how about earthquakes with epicenters outside California and a neighboring state, but still impacting California, considering jurisdiction limitations of most uh, California clearinghouse managing partners, how does the clearinghouse function differently for such events? Um, well, if we, if there, we had a, a very large earthquake in an adjacent uh, state that impacted California, we still would easily put up our clearinghouse within California boundaries to, to serve um, our constituents and to, to work from you know, from that site within the state. So that um, would still go on as, as normal. Um, I know during the, the Mina uh, 2020 6.5 earthquake in Nevada, um, we had scientists uh, go out and assist, they had permission to go out and assist them with their data collection. Um, so we provided that, uh, California Geological Survey provided that sort of, you know, availability to help them as did, we had some Nevada geologists come and help collect data uh, for our database uh, during the Ridgecrest earthquake. So there's some reciprocity, I can't say that word just right, but in terms of scientific uh, information gathering, but in terms of uh, damage, uh, we would be, uh, locating within the community uh, that have been impacted. I would also I say there's a, a lot of coordination underway right now and beginnings of conversations between oh, yeah. different clearinghouses. Uh, Idaho has a formalized earthquake clearinghouse. Some other states do. There's um, development right now in Washington state in a, in a multi-hazard clearinghouse uh, development. And so there's beginning to be more and more conversations to facilitate uh, clearinghouse co coordination and on a regional scale. Uh, and and uh, beginning to think about how that communication would work, um, but we do would we do imagine that clearinghouses might form in, in multiple states for the same event. Uh, thinking of like a Cascadia event where there's definitely both going to be impacts across states, but also beginning to think about how um, knowledge sharing and some uh, support across state boundaries might be possible in the future. As uh, some discussions are actually underway right now about that, so. Uh, a, a good point, Buddy, and I think uh, an area that we need to continue to, to work on. That's all that I see in the Q&A. Did we miss anything in the chat? Um, it's imperative. Yeah. 
if we're missing anything uh, that got buried in the chat, please go ahead and put it in the, the Q and A, um, the Zoom. We can we can comment on it. Otherwise, I, th I think most of the questions did get done. pushed over there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys uh, for hanging in there with us, and please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have more questions. Uh, we've included our, you know, our emails and our contact information in our talks. These talks uh, will be posted um, on the California Earthquake Clearinghouse website. I think we currently have uh, the first session link uh, up there already. So um, please feel to check that out. And Cindy, before we go, there was one final question about the mm -hmm. SAT program. And if uh -huh. um, maybe, oh. Gerber, if you could answer that one about whether it's possible for SAP to expand uh, opportunities to place placards and training to um, other positions like fire inspectors, code enforcement officers, housing inspectors who already have the authority, sometimes locally. Um, uh, curious if this might help extend resources that trained engineers could wind up at um, more uh, critical facilities. And I yeah, that's a really good, um, that's a really good thought. We haven't really put in, we're mostly focused on engineers right now because that's who we know we could validate with the, with the licenses and they have to update their license every few times, a uh, few years. Um, it is an interesting thought. It's just, we got to figure out a way to validate their licenses and verify that they're qualified to do those. So um, maybe we could look into that. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. I think that was the last one I saw missing. Thanks for extending for me. Thank you all for joining us today and um, take care.